So we're going to talk about electromagnetic radiation. But first, two slide, one slide review of where we were. Magnetic and electric fields. So the last thing we talked about was magnetic induction. And magnetic induction is pretty important because it is a gateway to a unified field theory. You would have heard me uh, spaz out about that if you watched the video that you were supposed to watch before starting assignment 13. Um, magnetic induction is basically, well, that's what's on this slide here, the top two things. A changing uniform magnetic field throughout a loop induces an EMF around that loop. So in this picture here, you've got a magnetic field coming out of the screen. There's a loop that's supposed to be that square is a loop of wire. If the strength of the magnetic field is changing, it will induce a current around that wire. Really what it induces is an EMF, an electromotive force, which is like a voltage, um, around that loop. And then if there's some resistance in the wire, the EMF will drive a current. If there's no resistance, it'll drive an infinite current. So there's always some resistance. So there'll be a current that flows as a result of the EMF. And the EMF results from the changing magnetic field. Now, the other way, and this was the whole generator thing, is that if I were to rotate that wire, uh, that loop, and rotate it sort of like um, like this, right? So if these are the two edges, if I rotate it like that, what that means is that the, uh, the total a number of field lines, so the field lines are these little arrows coming out of the page here, so it looks like a dot with a circle, crossing the area is going down. So the magnetic flux, and remember magnetic flux is the magnetic field dotted with the area vector, and the area vector is perpendicular to the area. So as the area vector becomes more and more perpendicular with the magnetic field, the magnetic flux will be going down. That's also a changing magnetic flux through the loop, or if we hold the loop still, and we reduce the strength of the magnetic field, that's a changing magnetic flux. And both of those cases, you get an EMF, and the equation was simple. It was just delta phi divided by delta T is the EMF, where delta phi, well, phi, capital phi sub B, is the magnetic flux. The rate of change of the magnetic flux is the EMF that's induced. But if you think about it, what's an EMF? It's a thing that can drive current. What is current? Moving charges. What gets charges moving? Well, you know, magnetic fields, if charges are already moving, magnetic fields will exert a force on it. But if the charges aren't moving, there'll be no magnetic force on it. But in any event, an electric field will exert a force on a charge. So if there's charges that are still and then they get moving, that tells you, oh, there's an electric field present. So the EMF, really, it means there's an electric field that gets induced in this little current wire. So a changing magnetic field can induce an electric field. That's this bold thing here. A changing magnetic field induces an electric field. And this is, um, this is where we see the unification of electric and magnetic fields into the electromagnetic field. And you've certainly heard that word many times before. And although I'm not going to go over this in great detail, it also turns out that a changing electric field can induce a magnetic field. Now, you might think, oh, well, so charges cause electric fields. And so if you move charges around, that's going to give you a changing electric field because the charges are moving. So the electric field is going to have to change. We also know that moving charges give rise to magnetic fields. Well, yes, all that's true. But but it turns out if you have an electric field all by itself, um, where does it come from? Charges. But I'll come back to that in a moment. If you have an electric field and you change that electric field in direction or in strength, it will induce a magnetic field right there, right? Not just because the charges are moving, but immediately where the electric field is changing, immediately you get a magnetic field and vice versa. So changing electric fields induce magnetic fields, changing magnetic fields induce electric fields. One of the sad things about not having lab, because we're all stuck at home now, is that we didn't do the magnetic induction lab, which is a pretty cool one. So that's a lab where we had solenoids. Uh, remember, those are just big stacks of uh, loops of wire. That's all a solenoid is. We had solenoids, and um, we would have induced voltages in those solenoids. We'd have induced currents in them or induced EMFs around the solenoids. First, just by pushing a magnet into it. So if you have if you have a solenoid and you have a, a bar magnet and you push the bar magnet into the solenoid, well, originally there's weak or no magnetic field through the loop of the solenoid. You put a magnet into it, and now there's a magnet right there, so there's a strong magnetic field right there. In the process of pushing it in, you are changing the magnetic flux through the solenoid, and we would have measured 
using voltmeters, really using something like a voltmeter, but it was hooked up to the computer, we would have measured the voltages that are induced and the rate at which they change as a result of pushing that magnetic field through. So you would have actually seen magnetic induction in action. And sadly, we weren't able to do that because we can't have lab because we're all far away from all of these solenoids and magnets and computers and things that we would have used to do it. And then here's another thing we would have done. We would have had two solenoids like this. We would have had a bigger one and a smaller one. And then what we would have done is we would have taken the smaller one here and we would have inserted it into the bigger one so that we had two nested solenoids. And so that's what this diagram up here is supposed to look like. The, um, the circles on the inside here, right, these inner circles, and you see there's a dot on the left and an X on the right. So that's that standard um, vector way of saying, oh, look, there's current coming out on the left and current going out on the right, right? So, so if you'd use your right hand rule, current coming out on, uh, current coming out of the page on the left, going into the page on the right, you can use the curly shorthand right hand rule to say, oh, that means there's gonna magnetic field inside the solenoid in that direction. And so I've indicated that here. Well, and then what we would have done is I would have actually hooked up an AC power supply to this. So at one instant, the current would have been coming out on the left and going on the right. But because it's an AC power supply, um, the current's going to be sloshing back and forth. And so sometime later, the current will be in the opposite direction. It'll be um, going into the page on the left and uh, coming out on the right, right, into on the left, out of on the right. And now the magnetic field would have been that way. So the magnetic field would have been constantly varying up and down, right, up and then weaker and down, stronger, weaker, up, right. So the magnetic field would have constantly been doing that. And so you would have had a constant changing flux, sometimes growing in the upwards direction, sometimes growing in the downwards direction. And that changing magnetic flux, well, so then these circles on the outside, and I haven't drawn any vectors, they're just circles, that's supposed to look like a stack of loops of wire from the bigger outer solenoid, right? So we've cut it in half, you're looking at a cross section. Well, this magnetic field in the center of the inner solenoid is also piecing the, air, the area, piercing the area enclosed by the loops of this outer solenoid. So that's a changing magnetic flux through the outer solenoid that would have induced an EMF in the outer solenoid. And that's what this voltmeter here would have measured. And what you would have seen when we ran the AC current here, so that's what this thing labeled current in inner solenoid, the AC current that we would have run through the inner solenoid and we would have oscillated as a sine wave, we would have observed there was an EMF induced in the outer solenoid that looked like this. It was a sine wave, except that it was offset a little bit. If you're really technical, you might call that a negative cosine wave, but the only difference between a cosine and a sine is that they're offset a little, left and right. And in fact, if you look at the details of this, notice um, when the current in the inner solenoid is increasing, so in the direction that I have drawn um, the magnetic field and the currents there, if that current is increasing that way, it's going to be an increasing magnetic field in the upward direction. So right at t equals zero here, um, that's where this line is steepest. That's when it's increasing the most, you're going to get an EMF that is induced to fight that increase. So it's gonna be an EMF in the opposite direction that would tend to drive a current in the opposite direction because the current in the opposite direction would give you a magnetic field in the opposite direction that is there to fight the increase, right? And so that's when it's most. Now, right at the top of the sine wave, that's where the slope is very, it's instantaneously, the slope is horizontal. There's zero slope right at the top. It's just like if you throw a ball in the air, um, its velocity is upwards. Then at the peak, its velocity is momentarily zero and then right after it's downwards. So making the transition from upwards to downwards, it passes briefly through zero. So there's an instant here where the um, current is not changing. So therefore the magnetic field is not changing. So therefore the magnetic flux is not changing. And notice the induced EMF right there is also zero. So the whole thing will work out the way we talked about with Lenz's law. And you get this oscillating EMF as well. So if you have an oscillating current in the inner solenoid that induces an oscillating EMF in the outer solenoid. And now you might think, but wait a minute, if there is a current in the outer solenoid, that'll have a magnetic field and some of that magnetic field appears the inner solenoid. So 
shouldn't that then induce a thing back? And the answer is, well, yes. And so it can get pretty complicated. And so we, we introduced this concept called inductance, which we haven't talked about in this class, uh, but in some physics classes you do, and certainly in more advanced physics classes you do, um, as well as in electronics classes, you introduce inductance um, and all kinds of fun stuff can happen with inductance in circuits. Um, but we don't go into great detail about that in this class. What's important here is the concept of the changing magnetic field inducing an electric field, and then vice versa. Well, so if you think about it, a changing magnetic field induces an electric field, and if that changing magnetic field is sinusoidal, it's always changing. So it's going to induce an electric field that itself is changing. So lots of the examples we did were magnetic field that was changing linearly. Its, it's um, strength was just changing at a constant rate. And so it induced a constant electric field. But if it's a sinusoid, it's, it's wobbling up and down. The electric field it induces will wobble up and down. And then that electric field wobbling up and down will induce a magnetic field wobbling up and down. And the whole thing goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and keeps propagating. And that can even happen in free space. You don't have to have currents and charges there. Once you've got magnetic fields that induces electric fields, those electric fields will induce magnetic fields and they can push each other out and radiate away. And that's what electromagnetic waves are. And you usually call electromagnetic waves light. And that's probably what you call it most of the time. Although it turns out radio waves like gamma waves, um, they're all the same thing. I'll come back to that in a little bit. So this magnetic induction process is sort of the beginning of understanding of why you have electromagnetic waves. Changing electric fields induce changing magnetic fields, which induce changing electric fields back and forth, back and forth. It propagates out um, and there was light and it was good. Well, all right, so if you want to get more technical about it, analysis of the differential equations. What are differential equations? Oh, my goodness, it's a calculus thing. Don't worry about it. But it's ultimately what the real equations of electromagnetism are in this form. If you analyze those equations and if you know things about differential equations, you will recognize that if I play with the equations that describe electric fields and magnetic fields, I get something out of it called the wave equation, which shows waves propagating through space. Um, and it turns out if you play with the equations that describe electric and magnetic fields, well, there's a few constants that come into it. So in electric fields, we have this constant K here, Coulomb's constant, although it turns out when you do people who actually do physics, instead of K, they use this thing called epsilon sub zero. Um, and I didn't do it because it's just a little more complicated than K. And so we just stuck with K. But it turns out K is exactly the same as one over four pi epsilon naught. I say naught, N-O-U-G-H-T, and so epsilon naught is epsilon sub zero, same thing. And so if I plug in um, epsilon naught here, I get K, and you could actually calculate one over four pi, blah, 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 and you would get the K that I've given you before. So that is a constant associated with electric fields. We use that when we found the electric field around a point charge. Likewise, there's this constant mu naught, and that really is the one that we use when we're doing actual physics. Um, like the E&M course, the electromagnetism course that physics majors take, they use mu naught and epsilon naught. You may remember the current around a long wire, its strength. Well, if there's current going through a long wire, the strength of the magnetic field a distance r away is mu naught i over 2 pi r. So mu naught is a constant associated with magnetic fields. When you put the two together using this differential equation math, you discover that waves propagate electromagnetic waves propagate. And if you calculate the speed at which they propagate, it works out just from the equations that they propagate at a speed, which we will call C for the speed of one over the square root of epsilon naught times mu naught. And if you work that out, it comes out to 2.99792 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, or to three significant figures, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And you may have heard that number before as the speed of light. Um, and so this sort of physicist in the 19th century sat up and noticed this said, wait a minute, these electromagnetic waves are propagating at this thing that and, and they did have measure, it's really hard to measure something that goes that fast, but they did have some measurements of the speed of light. These electromagnetic waves are propagating at the same speed that light goes at. And so that's how we made the connection that light itself is an electromagnetic wave. And so we know that now, you know, this is centuries old physics at this point to know that light is electromagnetic waves. So all this electricity stuff, all this magnet stuff, it leads up to light. It's all related to light. Incidentally, so that's what, what is electromagnetic radiation? Light, although it can also be gamma waves. 
uh, gamma radiation. It can also be radio waves. All of that is electromagnetic radiation. Sometimes when you watch scientific uh, science fiction shows, they will talk about there's dangerous EM radiation and, oh, my God, we're going to see some EM radiation. What are they talking about? Light, right? You know, so if you walk around and it's not dark, there's EM radiation all around you. Radiation. Radiation is scary. So you should be frightened all the time. And in fact, if you are not at temperature absolute zero, and if you are, it means you're dead, and also you're somehow walled off from the universe. Um, so if you are at the temperature you're at, you are glowing in the infrared. You are emitting electromagnetic radiation at all times. You are radiating. You're also radioactive, but that's a different thing for a different day, uh, which sadly I don't think we're even going to get to this semester because we've been slowed down by this virus. So electromagnetic waves. So I want to uh, just briefly talk about waves in general. That's what all these plots here are supposed to represent waves somehow. What are all these plots? So slow down. Let's just look at the very top plot here. I am plotting a, a, a vertical thing is supposed to be an amplitude. Amplitude of what? Electric field strength. But this could be anything. So instead of waves, you can imagine waves on the surface of water. Or if you have a long string and you wiggle it back and forth, you'll see waves propagate down the string. So waves on a string, things like that. Uh, and it'll wiggle up and down if you wiggle your, your arm back and forth fast enough. So it's whatever is waving. Think of it as the height of the water or the strength of the, of the electric field. Whatever is waving. The horizontal axis is x. So this is at t equals zero. At one instant in time, if you take a snapshot of the water, you'll see the surface sort of goes up and down in wave formations. And the simplest wave is just a sine wave, it turns out. And so that's what I've drawn here. So at one moment in time, and I've just chosen x equals zero to place where the wave is at one of its crests, the thing wiggles up and down. Well, that's actually not even, that's just a sinusoid. That's not even necessarily a propagating wave. That's just a sine function. But what makes it a wave is that if I look at some time later, and you'll notice I said time t of one-fourth capital T, what's that? Well, capital T is the period. I'll come back to that in a moment. But for now, it's just some time later, I take another snapshot of the wave. And what you should notice about this snapshot of the wave is the whole thing has moved forward. Notice that the crest that used to be here at t equals zero is now a little bit forward. And the first time it crosses zero is now a little bit forward. And what about this crossing zero that's at t equals zero? Well, that would have been if I had plotted the wave backwards a little bit, there would have been a crossing of zero here that has now moved forward. So you'll notice this second line, the whole sine function has moved to the right a little bit. And so if I go another time later, t equals one half t, so this is just twice as long as the first one, you'll notice that the first crest has moved forward um, twice as far as it did up here in the first time step. So the whole thing is moving forward. Go down to t of three-fourths t, it's moved forward again. And then finally, t equals capital T later, it has moved forward. But notice it has moved forward so much, right? So this crest right here is really this crest for t equals zero, the whole thing has moved forward between here and here. And now there's a new crest at t equals zero that was to the left of the y-axis in the first plot. But notice this plot looks exactly like the first plot. So there's a wave that has moved forward, but it has moved forward just enough that it has lined its pattern back up with itself again. Um, so the period of the wave is how long does it take for the wave to line itself back up with its pattern? Basically, that's what the period of the wave is. Well, all right, so each one of these is a plot of position versus time. If I go to the next slide here, ignore everything except this, this top plot here. This is just one of the plots. In fact, it's say the t equals zero plot. Again, I am plotting, and now I'm specifically plotting an electromagnetic wave. So I say E sub y. I'm assuming the electric field is pointing in the y direction. And it starts positive, and then later it's negative. What does that really mean? When I say E sub Y is negative, the Y component is negative. So the um, electric field is pointing in the minus Y direction. That's sometime later. So, or not some time later, some position off to the right, because here I am plotting position versus strength of magnetic field, electric field, strength of electric field. And then A is what we call the amplitude of this wave. Right, so the amplitude is how far away from zero does it get? What's the strongest in magnitude the electric field ever is. And so this is exactly the same as what you saw on the previous page. It's just a sine wave, um, oscillates with position. We call lambda the wavelength, that is the distance from one crest to the next crest. Or equivalently, it could have been the distance from one place where it crosses zero to the next place it crosses zero going in the same direction. Right, so you're crossing zero down to crossing zero down 
That's the wavelength. This is if you take a snapshot of the wave at one instant in time. Well, what I've plotted on the bottom now is what if I look at the wave at time t equals zero? So let's go back to the previous slide. I'm sorry, not time t equals zero. Look at the wave at position x equals zero. If I go to the previous slide, you'll notice if I look at x equals zero, it starts high, it goes down to zero, it goes down to low, it comes back up to zero, it goes back up to high. So that's what I've plotted here um, on on the bottom thing, notice this is a, it's a plot of the electric field as a function of time. So this is at one point in space as a function of time. It starts high, goes down to zero, goes low, goes up to zero, comes back up, right? And so it just keeps oscillating back and forth. So I could either plot it as a look at it at one snapshot in time, plot the electric field as a function of position, that's the top plot, or at one point in space, at that point, what is the electric field as a function of time? And you get this. Now, really, the whole thing is just this big, long wave that's happily moving along. And um, you know, that's really what's going on is this big, long wave that's happily moving along. But um, if you plot, you know, how do you, when you do a static plot that's not animated, you have to pick one and plot it like that. And you can get these functions if you plot... Um, if, if it has this form, E sub Y as a function of X and T. So here's what I'm assuming is that you've got a wave propagating in the X direction. It's an electromagnetic wave and the electric field points in the Y direction. So notice the electric field points perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Um, is A times the cosine of KX minus omega T where k is 2 pi over lambda. Lambda is the wavelength. And so if you think about that, what is the cosine of 2 pi is the same as the cosine of 0. That's how, that's how cosines work. So um, when x equals lambda, it's the cosine of 2 pi. right? So, then that's, so that's how the, the wavelength thing works. So k is 2 pi over lambda. And then omega is 2 pi over t. So t is the period of the wave, lambda is the wavelength of the wave. So that's how this cosine works out, k of kx minus omega t. Um, and then you would get plots just like what I showed you below using this. And so that's how you get a propagating wave propagating in the plus x direction. To propagate in the minus x direction, you would have had kx plus omega t. But I won't go into great detail with that sort of thing here. So we have a kx cosine of kx minus omega t, that is the equation of the electric field that describes a propagating sine wave. And again, the various things that we have here, lambda is the wavelength, k is this thing called the wave number, whatever, it's 2 pi over lambda. t is the period, that's just how long does it take to go through one oscillation at one point in time. Omega we call the angular frequency, it's in radians per second, it's actually very analogous to an angular speed that we talked about back in the first semester. But then there's this also this thing called the frequency, and that's what I call F here. F is just 1 over T, the period. So if the period is 10 seconds, 1 over T would be 0.1, and then we say cycles per second. You may have heard of cycles per second. We call that hertz. Also, hertz is cycles per second. So omega is angular frequency is like radians per second, although we, since, remember, radian is not really a unit, we just call it per seconds or seconds to the minus one. So angular frequency and frequency, you want to make sure not to mess them up. A whole bunch of students on the physics 351 exam two got a, uh, one of their answers off by a factor of two pi because they confused frequency and angular frequency. Um, and then if you think about the speed of the wave, well, it takes time capital T, the period for the wave to move one wavelength, right? Um, in fact, go back to the previous slide again. Notice from t equals 0 to t equals capital T, this crest has moved from 0 to 1 wavelength over. So the speed is just the wavelength divided by the period. And of course, the period is 1 over the frequency. So that's uh, the same as the wavelength times the frequency. Or if you substitute wavelength and period for k and omega, just solve those two equations for um, lambda and t and substitute in, you will get that the speed of the wave is also omega divided by k. So you get electromagnetic waves, they are that speed, and if you're in a vacuum, now if you're in material it gets more complicated, but a vacuum, and air is close enough to a vacuum that you can approximate it, that omega k is always going to work out to be the speed of light 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So this slide here tries to visualize a whole electromagnetic wave all at once. Now, these 
pictures can be a little bit deceptive because we make the analogy to waves on a string. And so if you imagine like the electric field here is the string profile, the string, if the say the string is going to the left or the wave is propagating to the left. So if the string were just straight, it would be left, right. The string itself physically moves up and down, right? It's moving up and down. That's how a wave strings or the surface of water. Waves propagate along the surface of the water. The surface of the water physically moves up and down. Nothing is moving up and down in space here, right? This is a wave along this ray. This is a light ray that you're looking at here. So just along this direction in space, this is just one line in space. There is nothing in space plotted to up above or below this. The strength of the electric field is represented by these arrows that are vertical on the on the drawing. So um, along the wave, it, it oscillates between pointing in the upwards direction and the downwards direction. But remember, this is a, this is how we visualize these vector fields. All of these are the electric field at the position of the tail of the vector. So we are just drawing the electric fields along this one light ray. There's nothing in space moving up and down. The electric field is a vector at that position. We can visualize it as this arrow and then the magnetic field and then here's the way these things work the magnetic field is perpendicular to the electric field um and that's because there's all these cross products and stuff that show up into all of this so things end up perpendicular to other things so the magnetic field is perpendicular to the electric field and this is what we call a um single polarization wave we'll come back to that shortly we have the electric field and um I haven't put any axes on here, but you could say if the propagation, if the direction of propagation, that thing sort of coming out of the page to the left of the, is the Z axis, then the electric field up and down would be the X axis and the magnetic field left and right would be the Y axis. And it turns out that if you have a single polarization wave like this, the direction of propagation is the same as the direction of E cross B, right? Use your right hand rule. Here's my right hand. E is that way. B is that way, right? So E cross B would be out of, the, out of the page here, that's this picture on the lower right of this slide. Um, or if you look, you could use your right hand and see on this other thing I've drawn. So that's a way of visualizing what an electromagnetic wave is. But I want, I'm gonna say this again, because it's very important, because misconceptions are brought up. And the way people talk about this, especially with Polaroids, I think encourage this misconception. Along this line, we are plotting it just in space along that line we are not plotting anything in space above and below that line. The only above and below is because we are using an arrow to represent the strength of the electric field. So the electric field points in that direction, but it's an electric field. It's not a physical arrow in space. So there's nothing extending up above this line. It's just the direction of the electric field is upward here and then downward here and then upward here and downward here, so on and so forth. All right, so that's what one... Uh, thing like this would look like or not look like because what does it look like there's a whole thing there what, what does something look like it's what your eyes see what do your eyes see waves interacting with the chemicals in your retina so you don't see electric fields ever except that you do because light is electromagnetic field so that's what seeing is right these little arrows in space you don't actually see little little arrows in space we use this as a way of visualizing vectors. If you're moving, there's no arrow sticking out of the front of you that's your velocity vector. We use that arrow as a way of visualizing it, right? There's nothing, right? If you're walking towards the wall, you don't stop. You don't, you know, you have a velocity vector sticking out of your front. You don't stop before you hit the wall because your velocity vector has hit the wall and it's a strut keeping you from going, from going any further. That's not what velocity vectors are. We visualize it as an arrow sticking out of you, but really, that's just a way of visualizing it. Really, you are moving in that direction. And so you have a speed and a direction. And so it's a vector quantity. The arrow is just a way of visualizing it. Same thing here. The arrows are a way of visualizing the electric and magnetic fields. Well, all right. So we come to the electromagnetic spectrum. And almost certainly in 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd classes you've taken, you have seen a an image something like this, the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is just to remind you once again that... Gamma, wa gamma rays, X-rays, radio waves, infrared, and visible light, all the same physical phenomena, and that is this phenomena of electromagnetic waves that we've been talking about. Um, and if you look at this, um, you will notice that the electromagnetic spectrum spans many orders of magnitude of wavelength or frequency, 
you know, on the, on the bottom and top, respectively. And that what we call the visible spectrum is really just a tiny slice of it. And that's just because that's the range of electromagnetic waves that your eyes are sensitive to. Now, you are actually sensitive to more than that. If you go out uh, or do this, go uh, if you have an electric stove, go turn on the burner, but not so high that it glows red. Right? If you make it really hot, it glows red. But make it just turn it on a little bit and then hold your don't touch it. I don't, I'm not telling you to burn yourself, but hold your hand over the burner. You feel the heat coming off of it. Um, that heat actually comes from two things. One, the air gets heated up, and so the air molecules run into your hand and transfer energy that way. But also, you're, you're feeling the radiation directly. So you can, quote unquote, see infrared light with all of your skin, right? All of your skin is one big retina that can detect infrared light. Kind of cool, huh? You also detect ultraviolet because your skin absorbs ultraviolet photons and gets sunburns from it. So your eyes are sensitive to visible light, but actually the other wavelengths of light do interact with your body. And so infrared light you feel is, is heat, right? Um, so we do actually absorb electromagnetic radiation other than just visible light. But when we say light, we usually mean visible light because uh, that's what our eyes see. And then when we, you know, that's just, how, how vocabulary works in our language and visible light well shorter wavelengths is bluer light longer wavelengths is redder light here's another thing that just zooms in on the visual spectrum um, and you hear here we've got the you may have heard of Roy G Biv uh, and that's going from low frequency to high frequency or because frequency is one over wavelength from high wavelength to low wavelength red orange yellow green blue indigo Violet. What's indigo? It's a bookstore in Canada. Indigo. Who? What? Nobody talks about indigo. I guess they do because somehow there's seven colors in the rainbow. Well, there's not seven colors in the rainbow. There's an infinite number of colors in the rainbow because it's a continuum. Um, and then just we sort of divide them up arbitrarily based on what they look like. But so so the fact that there's seven colors in the rainbow is just convention. And indigo. Pff, who needs it? Whatever. The six colors: red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. That's enough. Um, in fact, I sort of like red dot dot blue. And then what is violet? Something that's bluer than blue. What does that mean? Don't worry about it. Um, monochromatic. Now, monochromatic means single color. When I say that, um, I don't just mean that everything is the same color. I mean that there is electromagnetic ra radiation all of exactly one wavelength. Monochromatic, right, which is different because you could have things that look blue to you, but it's a mixture of wavelengths and it's how your eyes interpret it. I'll get to that in the next slide. Monochromatic blue, meaning all exactly the same wavelength. Well, there's actually, notice blue here is a whole range. But, for example, 470 nanometers, a nano, remember nano is 10 to the minus 9, so that's 470 times 10 to the minus 9 meters is the wavelength of blue light or a wavelength of blue light. I also like to use the angstrom. Angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Optical astronomers like angstroms. Um, I was an op, well, really I was an infrared astronomer, so I liked microns, but then I was also an optical astronomer, so I liked angstroms. Angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Um, so blue light, 470 nanometers. If you figure out the frequency, it's 6.4 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Cycles per second is huge. And that's why we don't experience light as something waving up and down, right? If you think about water waves, what's the time it takes them to wave up and down at one point? It's of order a second, right? That you can see is a wave. Something that goes up and down 10 to the 14 times a second, you're not going to see anything going up and down. So your eyes don't even really work that way by sort of resonating with it. Even radio waves will be like megahertz, thousands of cycles per second. So we can call them waves, and we actually have we have detectors fast enough that can, you can see the stuff wiggling up and down on the detector. But again, you're not going to see that in real time as a person. Red light, longer wavelengths, 650 nanometers, you would see as a slightly pinkish red. You'll notice where I've pointed it, it's over towards the orange side of the red. Why 650 nanometers? I chose that because that's actually a wavelength of a transition in hydrogen. So it's an important wavelength, but whatever. Uh, so that's visible light. But previous slide, all these other things are light as well. Light, electromagnetic wave, same thing. So ultraviolet light just has higher frequency than visible light. And then x-rays, gamma rays, higher still. Infrared, infra means below. So that's lower frequency than red or longer wavelength than red on down through radio waves. Now, colors are more complicated than wavelengths. 
Because color, when you say color, what you really mean is what you are perceiving. And your perceiving is not just measuring a wavelength. Uh, it's more complicated than that. The way your eyes work is that you have three, although I think some people have four, different types of chemicals. And then there's these mantis shrimp that have like 13 or 18 or whatever it is. Different chemicals that are responsive to different wavelengths of light. And so that's what the, this plot is supposed to indicate. So horizontal axis wavelength, vertical axis detection efficiency. That's just how sensitive is the chemical to these wavelengths of light. So let's let's start with this blue one on the left here. Um, anywhere between about 400 and 500 nanometers, if light of that wavelength comes in, this chemical will respond to it and send nerve signals to your brain saying, hey, dude, I got excited. Um, I, I detected some light and I'm a blue detector, so it must have been blue light I detected. Um, and you notice it's not uniformly responsive. The detection efficiency is peaks right around just below 450. You know, there's something like 445, more or less, nanometers. And if it's below 400 or above about 500, really 550, it won't detect it at all. So the detector just won't see it. So you have those. Then you also have your green and your red detectors. And you, you notice from the point of view of if I was designing an eyeball, I wouldn't have designed it this way. I would have made the green detector not overlap the red detector so much. It would have been easier to distinguish light. This is also related to why red-green color blindness is so common. What the people we call colorblind... There's nothing blind about them. They just have a different set of uh, color detectors than people who, quote unquote, aren't colorblind are. And as a result, colors that the non-colorblind people can distinguish, colorblind people have a harder time distinguishing. To the mantis shrimp who have 18 different chemicals and can distinguish 18 different ranges of wavelengths, we are all massively colorblind because we can't distinguish colors that they could distinguish. Right. So colorblindness, it's not really... Um, it's not really a disability or anything like that. It's just you have different chemicals that you detect. Well, but then, of course, if somebody goes and embeds their red stoplight um, and they let the trees overgrow it with green, it makes it really hard for people who are colorblind to tell what color the light is. It's not so much colorblindness. It's just that we have designed the colors that we use for things in society to match the the color detection that most of us have. And if somebody has color detection that's a little different, then it doesn't work for them so well. So the way your eyes work is that light comes in um, depending on the wavelength of light, right? So if the wavelength is around 550 nanometers, your blue receptors won't respond at all, but your red and green response receptors will both respond. Ping, 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 ping. And your brain will say, all right, so those two receptors are responding equally. I'm going to interpret this as yellow. Whereas if 650 nanometers comes in, your green and blue don't respond at all, but your red detector does respond. And so your brain is going to say, oh, I'm going to interpret this as red. Um, and, um, but you could imagine, so really when light comes in, it's almost never monochromatic. It's a mix of all different colors. And in fact, if it's a uniform mix or a big broad mix of all different colors, all of your receptors respond equally. We see that as white light. But you could imagine a mixture of light at, say, 650 and 450 nanometers. That's going to make the red and blue things respond. But you'll notice the response of the green is very is basically zero here. The red response is low, but it's there. The green response is, is very low. Yeah, it's not completely zero. But your brain's going to say, oh, I have some mix of the red and the blue receptors. Let's call that purple. Um, and so really what you get, you don't detect individual wavelengths of light we can build instruments we call spectrometers or optical spectrometers um, to uh, tell us exactly what wavelength of light is coming through. But that's not what your brain does. Your brain just has this broad, oh, I've got some light that's somewhere in this range and some light that's somewhere in this range. And based on how they're mixed, that's what we call the colors. All right. <clears throat> I mentioned a few slides back this thing called polarization. Um, and that's because when I drew this picture, if I go back a little bit, notice I had um, the direction of propagation was sort of out of the page and, and to the left, mostly out of the page here. The electric field was up and down. The magnetic field was left and right. That was really just one polarization. I come back here. Um, notice, well, okay, first notice this thing, if I rotate it, so I'm looking right down the arrow, that is the direction of propagation. That's this plot 
in the lower right of the screen here. So in that case, coming out of the page is the propagation direction of the wave. The electric field is up and down. The magnetic field is left and right. If you do E cross B, that gives you the direction of propagation. Well, there's nothing in saying, well, the electric field has to be up and down. So if we go here, um, if light waves are propagating out of the page, the electric field could point in any direction, any direction at all. Um, and if it does, the magnetic field will be perpendicular to it. But in practice, when light comes at you, it's actually a mix of light of all different directions of electric field all kind of mixed together. So what happens, you know, any one point in space in one time, the electric field points in one direction, but it will vary its direction sort of wildly. And so it's not all polarized light that is just with the electric field pointing in one single direction. We say it's a mix of polarizations. And it turns out just as you can represent a vector in the xy plane as the sum of something times x hat plus something times y hat, right? It has an x component and a y component. You can represent any polarization of an electromagnetic wave as a sum of these two, the vertical electric field polarization and the horizontal electric field polarization. Um, some combination, so if it's vertical, it's all one times vertical plus zero times horizontal. If it was at a 45 degree angle, you would have one over the square root two vertical plus one over the square root two horizontal. Y square root two instead of one half. Think about the Pythagorean theorem, right? X squared plus Y squared is Z squared. If X and Y are the same as each other and Z is one, X and Y both have to be one over the square root of two. So when you square it, you get one half. One half plus one half is one. That's where I got that square root of two from. So most light you see is what we call unpolarized. It's a mix of all different polarizations, which you can just say is a mix of vertical and horizontal, um, and the mixture sort of changing at every instant that light comes in. But it is possible to polarize light waves with these things called Polaroids. You can get polarized glass, and what that will do is absorb or maybe reflect all horizontal polarized light and transmit all vertical polarized light, other than if you rotate the glass 90 degrees, it's now transmitting horizontal, right? It's just whatever the, the chemical composition of the glasses. And sometimes sunglasses are like this. If you get sunglasses, they're dark glasses. Sometimes they're polarized sunglasses. They're actually not just making it dimmer. You can have neutral density glass that just absorbs all light, like 50% of all light that comes through. But you can also have polarized glass that will absorb all the vertical polarization and only let the horizontal polarization through. And here's a trick you could do. And sadly, I don't have any Polaroids to demonstrate this with, is if you have two Polaroids, um, so if you think about, if I had two just dark pieces of glass and they cut off half the light, well, and if I put that piece of glass in front of a light source, only half of it's going to get through. So the light that gets through will be half as bright. And then if I put a second one in front, well, half of the half gets through, it'll be a quarter as bright, right? That's what you'd get. With polarized, if I have two, pe two polarized pieces of glass, and if I put and I orient them the same way, the first one's going to block out all the horizontal polarization and only admit the vertical. The second one will block out the horizontal, but there's none left and admit the vertical. And that's all that's left. The second one won't actually make it any dimmer at all, even though it, if you put it in front of unpolarized light, it would have made dinner, dimmer. Now, here's the fun thing. Rotate it 90 degrees. The first one's blocking out all vertical. The second one's blocking out all horizontal. Nothing gets through. It's completely black. And this is kind of a cool thing, right? That you can have two pieces of glass that all by themselves block out half the light. And with just uh, dark glass, you put the two in front of each other. Well, it gets darker, so you get a quarter of the light. But you can actually either block out with two next to each other, half of it, or even all of it. If you block out one polarization, then the other. Now, earlier, I talked about how this uh, drawing can be misleading because people will then sometimes represent polarized light as uh, glass with a vertical slit in it to suggest that, oh, the vertical slit will only allow things wiggling up and down to get through because if you imagine string, things going left and right will get blocked, right? They won't, they'll be blocked physically by a block there, but that's not, that's not how this really works. There's nothing offset up and down in space here, again, with, polar, with electric polarized. It's just the direction of the electric field. So you will you can find these all over the place. Physics books use them. If you look up polarization videos on the web, they will show you these little visualizations. And they're misleading because they make you think that uh, an electric field that's oscillating in the y direction has something actually moving up and down in space in the y direction. And that's not what's happening. Well, all right. So let's go back. Let's just consider a single polarization again. So you have polarized light. The electric field's always say in the y direction, whatever it is. 
We can define this thing called the pointing vector. It's named after a guy, but the name pointing, if you think P-O-I-N-T, is actually very suggestive. The pointing vector is useful for calculating because its magnitude is the power per area carried by an electromagnetic wave. Why per area? Um, well, so imagine if you have, think about collecting rainwater. Instead of electromagnetic rays, it's rain falling. The bigger the bucket, the bigger the opening area of the top of the bucket, the more water you're going to collect, right? So collecting water is like collecting power. So if you have a, a, an electromagnetic wave um, and you have a, a aperture, so it could be like the pupil of your eye or it could be the, the width of the lens of your camera, the wider, the more power you're going to collect. So to talk about the wave itself, we need power per area. And then how much light you collect depends on your collecting area of your pupil or whatever. So that's why we have power per area. So the pointing vector tells you how bright the light is, how strong the electromagnetic wave is. So that's the first thing it tells you. The second thing is the direction of the pointing vector is the direction that the light is going. All right. And then the pointing vector is 1 over mu naught. That's the same mu naught that we used before for magnetic fields um, times E cross B, where E is the... at and of course, the pointing vector varies with time because the strength of E and B vary with time. But at one instant, the power that's going through is just E cross B. Take the electric field, cross it with the magnetic field. That can tell you what's the direction of propagation of the electromagnetic wave. It tells you how much power there is. right? And so then how do you figure out the average power? Because if you think about um, light waves oscillating at 6 times 10 to the 14th cycles per second, you're not going to calculate the power um, in 1 10 to the 14th of a second, you want how much power do I get over the course of a whole second? Well, you're averaging over 10 to the 14th periods. Well, to find the hour, use the RMS. Remember RMS from AC circuits? Same thing. So um, the E RMS, you take the, um, the strength of the electric field at all instants in time, square them, take the average of all those squares. So that's the mean square, then take a square root. That's the root mean square. All right, so the ERMS and BRMS, that gives you the, the actual average power. And so that's how you could figure out um, how much power of light is shining on a through your eye, right? And then the power is going to be related very close to how bright it looks. It's also if you're trying to cook something with um, infrared radiation, um, which is basically how um, burners on stoves work or even ovens, right? They just shine infrared radiation. The power of infrared radiation is absorbed by the turkey or whatever it is you're cooking. Um, how, what's the rate at which energy is absorbed? Well, you can figure out the intensity of the wave. Um, you, if, and of course, when you're cooking, you don't think about electric and magnetic fields, but now we can. One other thing at the bottom here, it turns out, uh, because of the way these waves work, if you have a single, polarized, a single polarization wave, so that would be a wave, say, propagating in the z direction, the electric field, say, pointing in the x direction, the magnetic field in the y direction. And then, of course, magnetic electric field oscillates between plus x and minus x, and magnetic field oscillates between plus y and minus y. At any given instant in time, the strength of the electric field is equal to the speed of light times the strength of the magnetic field. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? Well, it came from the fact that electromagnetic waves are waves that propagate at the speed of light. And just be, the way we've defined electric or magnetic field, it works out that that constant is what you need to compare their strengths. There are other systems of units you can use where instead of C, you just have the strength of them are the same as each other. That's not the same strength of units we used. So electromagnetic waves, changing electric fields induce changing magnetic fields, changing magnetic fields induce changing electric fields. So you can set up this whole propagation and those propagations will propagate out through space as waves. In these electric waves, one polarization, the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other and the direction of propagation is perpendicular to both of those. So there's cross products. But then of course, waves can have any old polarization and they can go in any old direction. So right, random light bulb is shooting off light in all directions of all polarizations. You can polarize light with these things called Polaroids, glass that only transmits um, one polarization of light. Things like that. Well, all right. So light is electromagnetic waves. However, there are some phenomena of light, that things that light do, that cannot be explained by the theory of electromagnetic waves. And here's one of them. It's called the photoelectric effect. <laughs> 
The basic idea of photoelectric effect is you have some chunk of material, metal or something like that. You shine light on the metal. Well, we already know pointing vector, right, is the power per area. Power is energy per time. So if you shine light on something, you are delivering energy to it. What happens when you deliver energy to something? Uh, different things. Um, you could speed it up. The energy could go into kinetic energy. So when I deliver energy by pushing on something, that's what happens. You can heat it up. The energy goes to thermal energy. That's what happens when you shine infrared radiation on your turkey. Um, well, another thing that can happen is you can kick electrons out of that material. The energy can go into ionizing some of the atoms and giving the energy to kinetic energy of the electrons. So that's another thing that can happen. The energy goes into the material. The material releases the energy by shooting off electrons, and the electrons carry that energy away. Right? So that's the photoelectric effect. Light, you shine it on a material. If the light is enough and the right kind, you will get electrons that come off. And then if you, if you put a little electric field, you could accelerate those electrons away, detect them as a current, right? Because moving charges is a current. And you could use that um, to electrically detect that light has shined on a thing. Uh, and so that's used all the time. Um, sometimes there's little counters that detect if you have moved through something. What they have is light shining on a thing. There's current flowing. If you walk in the path of light, you temporarily block the light. The current stops. Your electric circuit can detect that the current stopped and say, oh, look, somebody just walked through here and then count number of people, something like that. So these are, um, these are things that are, this is a very useful thing, um, the photoelectric effect. You can also use this to create light detectors. It's not really how your digital cameras work, but it's related to how your digital cameras work. Light comes in, um, that energy is absorbed and kicks off an electron. It doesn't actually really go flying through space. It goes to other places in the solid state stuff, but it kicks off an electron. And then that electron can be uh, measured eventually as a current. Um, and then that electric signal lets you figure out that light came in and that's how a digital camera, very roughly speaking, that's how a digital camera works. So this is a useful thing. Well, all right, so there's, here's some observations about this. First of all, so, so for some given chunk of material, you have some like it's aluminum or copper or some alloy, whatever it is, you have some chunk, some specific type of material, light below a cutoff frequency, no matter how intense, ejects no electrons. Right, so let's suppose the cutoff frequency is, I don't know, 500 nanometers, right? Which is like bluish light or blue-green light. 600 nanometer light, which you'd look as like orange or red. No matter how intense that light, you will never eject electrons. Now, if you think about it from a wave point of view, um, the intensity, you can have any intensity of any color. You can have dim blue light and bright red light, right? So, but if, so if I have a longer wavelength or a lower frequency red light, no matter how intense it is, and the more intense it is, the more energy it is delivering per second to this thing, you do not eject any electrons. And that's really weird, right? Um, because it's just delivering energy. So why can't the energy build up and eventually build up enough to kick an electron out? It, do it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. That's surprising. Um, whereas if you have really weak light of high enough frequency, it will, not very fast, but it will kick out electrons. The wave description of light wouldn't suggest that. The wave description of light, it should just be the rate at which energy is emitted or is um, absorbed. The rate at which energy goes into the thing should relate to the rate at which electrons can come out. Huh. Next observation. Above the cutoff frequency, so you have frequency high enough to kick out electrons. The higher the frequency of the light, the faster the ejected electrons are. So if I suppose that 500 is the cutoff frequency, if I hit it with 500, the electrons come out barely moving at all. If I hit it with a higher frequency, so that was 500 nanometers. So if I hit it with a lower wavelength, which is a higher frequency, the electrons will come out faster. Higher frequency still, they come out faster still doesn't matter what the intensity of the light is, just the frequency. And again, this doesn't really jive very well with the wave interpretation of light because um, you can have at any given frequency a high intensity, which is a high amount of energy. Why don't the electrons get more energy because there's more energy coming in? Well, that's not how it works observationally. So first observation, there's a cutoff frequency. Second observation, 
the speed of the electrons is related to the frequency of the light, not the intensity of the light. And then third observation, if I take a given frequency of light that's above the cutoff frequency, so there will be some electrons, a greater intensity of light means more electrons, but not faster electrons. So even though there's more energy in the light, each electron doesn't have more energy. The speed of the ejected electrons is related to the frequency, the color of the light, not the overall intensity of light coming in. Now, higher intensity does you get means you get more electrons coming out per second. So there is more energy being emitted because each electron carries a certain amount of energy, but the energy of each electron is different. There's is the same for the same intensity of light coming in. And this does not jive with the wave interpretation of light. And Einstein is the one who really proposed the model that stuck for this. He did this in 1905. It was his miracle year. This paper is the one that really was the main thing cited in the Nobel Prize that he received. So even though we associate Einstein with relativity, um, he was also really deeply involved in the development of quantum mechanics. And this is one of the really early developments in quantum mechanics um, was his explanation of the photoelectric effect. How does he, how did he explain the photoelectric effect? He introduced the concept of photons, the particle of light. And here's the way a photon works. First of all, what's the definition of photon? A photon is the smallest amount of energy you can have in light of a given frequency. All right. So the energy of a photon is just this thing called Planck's constant. I give you the number below times the frequency, or remember the frequency is just the, the frequency times the wavelength is the speed of light. So the energy of the photon is HC over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of the light. So at a given frequency or at a given wavelength, um, you can have one photon's worth of light at minimum. If you try to have dimmer light than that, you just can't have it. This is quantum. This is what quantum mechanics is about. What does quantum mean? Quantized means comes in steps, right? If you think about a ramp versus a staircase, you can be at any height along the ramp. If you have, like, if you're resting on the ramp, but on a staircase, there are specific heights you can be at. Electromagnetic waves are more like the ramp. You can have, um, for monochromatic light, you can have any energy of light propagating along. Photons are like the staircase. You can have one photon worth, two photons worth, three photons worth, but not less than one. And you can only have an integral number of photons worth of light. If that's, that's what a photon really is. We call it the particle of light. So I just, I've been telling you all lecture, I've been telling you the electromagnetic waves, light is an electromagnetic wave. And now we're saying light is a particle. Is it a particle or a wave? And the answer is, well, both. Um, that's, so there's this thing called the wave particle duality in quantum mechanics, that if you try to describe the behavior of uh, particles or waves, light, Sometimes they behave like a wave. Sometimes they behave like a particle. So this theory of electromagnetic waves does really well at describing all kinds of stuff about light, but it gets some things wrong, like the photoelectric effect. We have to resort to photons for that. So the energy of a photon is HC over lambda. That's the smallest amount of energy you can have in light of a given frequency, and light comes in steps of that energy. Now, if you look at the number here, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. If I want to figure out what's the energy of a single photon? Well, remember the energy of a uh, visible photon is something like 10, or sorry, not the energy, the frequency of a visible photon is something like 10, 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz cycles per second, right? So if I want to multiply that by h, let's take 6 times 10, I'm going to go to 1 sig fig, so let's go 7 times 10 to the minus 34 times 6 times 10 to the 14. Well, 7 times 6 is 35. 10 to the minus 34 times 10 to the 14 is 10 to the minus 20, because when you're multiplying powers of 10, you just add the powers. So I have 35 times 10 to the minus 20, or 3.5 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That is the energy of one of these visible light photons. That is a very, very small amount of energy, right? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think like a, a baseball, the kinetic energy of a fastball is like 100 joules or something like that. And we were talking 10 to the minus 19 here. So if you ever 
have an appreciable amount of light, there's an ungodly number of photons. And so that's why we don't notice the steps. If you think about water, water's a fluid, right? It's continuous. You can always take water uh, and you can always divide it in half, right? You can always, you have a cup of water or a, let's use a graduated cylinder so you can measure it. You can dump it into two graduated cylinders and get half of that and then take that and dump it in half. And you keep, just keep doing that forever. Actually, you can't forever because you know water is made up of water molecules and eventually you'd be down to one molecule and you can't split that molecule and have it still be water, right? You can break it into oxygen and hydrogen, but it's not water anymore. Water comes in steps, but those steps are so small that we can treat it as just a continuous fluid. So most of the time you're experiencing light, there are so many photons there that it's like water molecules. You can just treat it as a continuous wave, right? But sometimes, sometimes the photons interact one at a time. And that's what happens in the photoelectric effect. So here's what's going on in the photoelectric effect. First of all, the material has this thing called a work function. What that is, is the amount of energy it takes to liberate an electron. Why does this exist? Well, because of atoms. And really, it's more complicated because there's a whole crystal structure of the material, whatever it is, but or molecules, whatever. But imagine an atom for now that's going to take a certain amount of energy to get an electron out of the atom. And then that amount of energy just depends on the properties of the atom. Same thing for materials. So the work function is how much energy you need to liberate an electron. Now, here's the key. Light interacts with atoms one photon at a time. If you have higher intensity light of a given wavelength, that's just more photons. So more photons can interact with more atoms all at the same time. But each atom interacts with only one photon. So to liberate an electron, the photon must have by itself, must have enough energy to overcome that work function. Right. So notice here, I have HF equals W plus one half MeV squared. HF is the frequency of the photon. So HF is the energy of the photon. If HF is less than W, you will not liberate any electrons. So if the frequency is too low of one photon, you will not liberate any electrons. If it's high enough, well, it has energy HF. It uses up W of that energy. So you subtract off W. The amount of energy left goes into the kinetic energy of the electron that comes out. So this is just an energy balance equation. Energy of photon equals energy it takes to liberate the electron plus energy the, the leftover energy the electron has. Right. So the photoelectric effect can be explained by thinking of light as photons where one photon interacts with one atom. It's not a continuous wave where the waves can build up over time. It's a collection of photons all coming in and on the atomic level light interacts as photons, right? Whereas if you're building like a radio receiver uh, for, a, to, to, for a radio or a Wi-Fi signal, it interacts as waves and you'd use the wave theory for light. So there's this wave particle duality. Electromagnetic radiation is electromagnetic waves, but it's also a collection of photons. So the theory that we've been talking about with these electric fields and electric fi uh, magnetic fields, all of that has been the classical wave description of light. Light's also photons. Well, I have a few questions I want to ask you about photons here. So again, remember with these questions, what I recommend you do after we've said the question, pause the video, commit to an answer, start the video again, we'll talk about the answer. So first of all, which has more energy, a red photon or a blue photon? Possible answers. The red photon, the blue photon, they have the same energy because each photon is the smallest amount of energy you can have in light, or it depends on the size of each photon. So pause now. And now that you're back, the answer is the blue photon. All right, so here's the thing. You have to be a little careful. Let's go back to the definition. A photon is the smallest amount of energy you can have in light of a given frequency. So if we have the frequency of blue light, one photon of blue light always has the same amount of energy. But a blue photon and a red photon, well, it's the smallest light of a given frequency. The energy of a photon is HF. Blue photons have higher frequency, lower wavelength, higher frequency than red photons. So the energy of the blue photon, HF, is higher than the energy of the red photon, HF, because F red is smaller than F blue. So the blue to photon has more energy than the red photon. So going back to this question, C um, was sort of the red herring here, or maybe it was a blue herring, hard to say. Um, because you, you may have remembered the definition, the photon is the smallest amount of energy you can have in light. Well, of a given frequency. So photons of different frequencies have different energy.
and then D, it depends on the size of the photon. The size, that what does that even mean? Well, you could say it depends on the energy of the photon, but the energy is directly related to the frequency. So if you have a higher energy photon, it's also a higher frequency photon. So when I say red versus blue, I've already told you one of them has higher frequency than the other. You can't have two red photons, one that's more energy than the other. If they're the same wavelength, they have the same energy, right? Uh, I just had this electromagnetic spectrum here again, so you can say, oh, look, blue has higher frequency than red. All right, next question. What do you get if you break a photon in half? Um, here are the possible answers. A photon with half as much energy in light of the same frequency. Two photons, each with half as much energy in light of the same frequency. A photon of lower frequency, two photons of lower frequency, or none of the above. Pause now. And the answer, actually, depending on what you mean when you say break in half, the answer is either D or E. Let's look at the rest. First of all, a photon with half as much energy in light of the same frequency. You can't have that because a photon of a given frequency has a given amount of energy. So if you have two photons of the same frequency, they have to have the same energy. So A is not even physically possible. B, two photons, each with half as much energy in light of the same frequency. No, you can't have that either because... If it's the, the frequency of the initial photon, it has the energy it has. So you can't have half as much energy, right? You can't get that. C, a photon of lower frequency. No, you can't get that either because of conservation of energy. If I have a photon and now I have a photon of lower frequency, I have less energy. Where did the rest of the energy go? Don't have that. So is it D or E? And now this depends on what do you mean when you say break a photon in half? My favorite answer to this is E. You can't break a photon in half. It is the smallest amount of energy you can have light of a given frequency. So it is what it is. You can't break it in half um, uh, any more than you can break an electron in half. You can't, you, just, you can't do that. You can't break an electron in half. There's no such thing as half an electron. Likewise, there's no such thing as half of a photon. You have light. You have a photon. That's it. That's the smallest thing you can have. However, there are processes, interactions with materials, where a material can absorb a photon and then emit two photons of lower frequency. It won't ever happen with a photon all by itself in space. That can't happen. But if it interacts with something, and there are these various crystals that do this, and it's kind of cool because you can do all kinds of fun quantum mechanic experience, um, experiments with them, um, where you absorb a photon and then the same amount of energy comes out in two photons of lower frequency. So you can't break a photon in half. But you can absorb the photon and use the energy of that photon to create two photons. But then if you're creating two photons, each has to have less energy than they started with. So the total energy is the same. So they both have to have lower frequencies. Just depending on what you mean, it's either D or E. All right, final question. Two monochromatic. What do I mean by monochromatic? Um, each light source has is emitting light at only one frequency. One source emits only red light. The other source emits only blue light. Which source has a higher energy output per second? think about this. Is it the red source, the blue source, or could it be either one? Pause now and commit to an answer. The answer is C. It could be either one. And again, this is, a, this is just to, to make, you know, one of the, re some part of the reasons I ask these questions is that I know um, I've seen students in the past make these mistakes. Um, you have learned that blue photons have more energy than red photons because blue photons have higher frequency and the energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. So if frequency is bigger, energy is bigger. So therefore, blue light has more energy than red light. And that last, therefore, is the problem. One photon of blue light has more energy than one photon of red light. But you could have 10 million photons of blue light and one photon of red light. Sorry, other way around. You could have 10 million photons of red light and one photon of blue light the total energy in red light is going to be more because you just have more photons, right? Which weighs more, a pound of lead or a pound of feathers? Well, you think, oh, lead is heavier than feathers, so lead. No, it's a pound. Both of them are a pound. Which weighs more, a pound of lead or 10 pounds of feathers? Even though feathers are light, you have 10 pounds of them. You have a whole lot of feathers. A little piece of lead, you know, one pound of lead is not all that big. 10 pounds of feathers, lots of feathers, right? Same thing here. You could have a very intense red light and very weak blue light. One photon blue light is brighter. So that's just a warning. Don't think too simplistically. Don't think, oh, we have memorized blue light has higher energy than red light. So therefore, all blue has higher energy than all red. Now, one photon. Distinguish between photon and a whole collection of photons.
All right, that's it for now. That's electromagnetic radiation.